to the recording and then hopefully uh, go away. Right. Well, thank you everyone for coming. Um, today is my 30th birthday. Uh, so, what better way to celebrate than to talk about <laughs> open research? Um, and thank you, Marion, for a lovely introduction. So, last week, Marina gave a talk on open science and, and why we need it, and the kind of tools that we have at our disposal in order to fight crime and the forces of evil. Um, and the thrust of her argument, the force of her argument, came from the fact that um, basically we're doing the right thing by addressing open, open research problems, uh, namely to target the replication crisis. Now, I'm not going to trouble you with that because we've already done that. Uh, we've done it. Uh, Joe Barnby gave a wonderful talk on open research practices and worked examples from his line. I gave a fantastic talk on Jasper and Jamovi. And Marion here gave a wonderful talk on Zotero, which got a lot of uh, interest off Twitter. Zotero actually got involved and stuff. Um, and I think that you're going to do a recording of, of that. And it's going to actually include some of the questions that came up as well. So, yes, doing these kind of things makes you sleep well at night. But uh, we all have a mortgage, or we have bills, or we want to we wanna have a job, basically. So I'm going to show you why you should just do it for selfish reasons. So you don't need to be shy and say, you know, greed is good. Because money does make the world go around. It is cash is king. And uh, so I'm going to sort of try to convince you for a kind of... Um, convince you over to, to, to think of uh, taking up open science just for your own gain. And the wonderful thing about open science practices is that you can do these things for selfish reasons and also help science at the same time. Okay, so no more ado. So this is Dorothy Bishop. Uh, some of you may know her, some of you may not. She's one of the head of the, the UKRM. And she published this lovely commentary uh, about the four horsemen of uh, irreproducibility. And basically what they are is uh, publication bias, where's my mouse, publication bias, low statistical power, p-value hacking and harking. So I'm guessing everybody sort of roughly knows what these four are. Harking is hypothesizing after the results are known. So basically, you run a study, you find the result that you don't want, and then you kind of think, well, maybe the hypothesis was a bit inferior to begin with, so we'll replace it with something else. So, you know, predictors for fMRI neurofeedback or something like that. Um, this is an in-joke. Um, so, to kick-start you and, and sort of introduce you to these things, there are four-ish papers which I highly recommend that you read. So, Publication Bias uh, by Mahoney. So, this uh, was published in, I think, 1975, so it shows you just how far back we go. And what they did was, what he did was he, he submitted for peer review uh, a set of identical papers, but the difference between them was one type of paper published uh, as reported a positive effect, so there was a statistically significant result, and the other one reported a null effect. And which one do you think was seen to be more fit for publication than the other? It was, of course, the one that showed a, a significant result. So that showed you that quite, I thought, quite elegantly. Low statistical power. So if you can't see that, this Finelli has done a couple of papers which are go-to papers when you want to sort of become conversant with uh, uh, re the replication crisis. And what they showed is that in mainly if you look at life and health sciences, namely psychology, um, there's something like an 80% Number, the number of published papers, 80% of them report positive effects, which is five times greater than rocket scientists. And I, I mean, I'm not casting aspersions, but I think rocket scientists are going to be far more on the ball than, than psychologists. And this, and this is particularly uh, demonstrated in the fact that we are really scraping the bottom of the barrel when it comes to reaching statistical power. So by, what, by, what I mean by statistical power is 
Uh, is your sample size adequately big enough to detect the effect that you expect? And what we see here is that we're not. So on the one hand, we've got all of these positive results, and on the other hand, we've got evidence to say that we shouldn't actually be finding them. So this is where, obviously, the low statistical power meets publication bias. And then p-value hacking and harking are kind of addressed in this famous paper by Simmons, which basically showed that just by playing the song When I'm 64 by the Beatles, people could be actually younger, not feel that they're younger, or is it the other way around? Anyway, their actual age changed, okay? And, of course, it didn't change. Spoiler alert. Uh, what, what, what you see here is actually uh, an abstract that they could have written to publish. And they just reported selectively certain things and then they massaged it into existence. And they did a lot of p-hacking, so they dropped a few outliers. Uh, they did an ANCOVER. Uh, you know, they, they, um, they only reported the fact that they didn't get null effects. Anyway, it did demonstrate quite compellingly that we've got a lot of degrees of freedom in which to torture a, a significant result into life. And for more on this, you can look at these two guys, Chris French and Stuart Ritchie, who gave talks to the Riots Club, and their talks can be found on the Riots OSF. So, why do the four horsemen exist? As I said, uh, one of the most powerful driving forces in the world is money. And this is uh, by Neuroskeptic, and it's Dante's reimagining of Dante's Circles of Hell. And you can see that uh, we get, the further down you go, the, like, the worse it is. So you get the worst case scenario of what perverse incentives can do. And these are, of course, inventing data. Partial publication or selective reporting, non publication, so just putting the uh, uh, no results in the file drawer. Plagiarism, creative outliers. So these are the things that really drive uh, the four horsemen into science. So how do we round them in? Dorothy wants us to round them in. How do we do that? So there's no silver bullet, but we've got bloody good ammo. And I'm going to show you four of those sort of. Um, I don't know, you're an expert in guns, aren't you? What would be a good ammo? Um, like go for armoured piercing incendiaries. Okay. So these are the armoured piercing incendiaries. Thank you, Adam. We've got preprints, register reports. Take that police that. Is that from a personal right. experience? <laughs> if I, yeah, I thought so. So let's start with preprints. By show of hands, anybody know what a preprint is? Okay, okay. And anybody. Not associated with the rights. Do you know what? All right. So basically, a preprint is what you submit to a journal, right? It's just the draft, the, the finalized draft, right? It's the it's the file that's labelled final, final, final underscore actual final uh, draft. And um, the reason why preprints have sort of taken on is because they address the first problem, which is publication bias. So the publication bias. If you have a rig system that only looks at for positive results. The best way to combat that is just to flood the market with all the null findings. And one way to do that is through preprints. Um, so you can see here in this flow chart that what people sometimes do, or well, I don't know what you do, Adam, but anyway, they submit to the journal at the same time that they upload it to a preprint server. Okay? Now, the most famous preprint servers are but for you guys, which are, I'm guessing, neuroscience, psychology, those kinds. It's psych archive and definitely bio archive for the geneticists in the audience. And there are, this paper here is a lovely paper, and it shows you all of the different benefits of preprints. And I won't go into all of them, but I will just draw your attention to four things. Uh, revisions. So on BioArchive you can get feedback uh, from people, so you can just have peer review that way if you, cho if you choose to do so. Uh, negative results, as I've said, you can publish negative results. But the, 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 re the ones that get people most aroused, if you like, is the career benefit and the funding benefit. So as I've said, the career benefits, right, so you increase your readership. 
So a lot of people that are upcoming starters, I mean, I'm talking Manny, Twitter, they all have preprints on Psych Archive. They all get their name out there. They plug their message loudly and clearly, pumping Psych Archive. You do get extra feedback. Now, there is an argument over whether this is good feedback, bad feedback, whether it should be anonymized, whether it should be, or whatever. But you do get feedback, or at the very least, you get endorsements through retweets and so on, which is quite a nice feeling when you've had a crap day with you know, fighting with your PI and you get somebody to say this is a really sound paper here. Um, but also you don't, don't forget that you do get private messages as well, which unlike Adam are usually positive. With you it's... it's. Um, By the way, uh, Sam, <laughs> when I'm not shooting down police yeah. helicopters, I'm occasionally on Twitter. Oh really? I wouldn't have known. Occasionally. Um, uh, there was a case recently where yeah. a, a woman had a paper rejected. Yes. Because she'd put it off to a preprint yeah. server and the, the journal had found it. And they said, yeah. oh, well, this breaches yeah. the preprint. Yeah. I'll come back to that. All right. So, uh, and obviously reach the public quicker. So, in fact, Psych Archive has got a bot on Twitter that um, retweets it out automatically. Now, the, the other thing is the preprints are recognized by the ref. Uh, which is obviously a boon for us. Now there are stipulations there, so it can be. So if you, it has to be the version that's accepted for publication. But it just means that you can just put put it out there already, if that makes sense. It's just it, it's more immediate rather than waiting for it to all be formatted and stuff. Um, and also, these funding agencies do recognise preprints as actual credible output as well. You know, the United States uh, National Institutes of Health, the MRC. As well. Now there are a few myths about preprints which Adam has, uh, has uh, mentioned. So they do. Uh, do they lead to scooping? Well, no. Uh, not at least in uh, in this sort of inflated way that people think. So pre uh, uh, scooping predates preprints. You can get scooped from conferences. I've been scooped from a conference. Uh, but the thing about preprints is that they have a DOI, so they're timestamped. So if anybody deigns to steal your work, you say, well, "Hang on, mate." you know, I did this last year, you've stolen my idea or something like that. And it's a huge embarrassment for the person who's stolen your work. And actually some journals protect against that. Um, Preprinting prevents publication. So this is what Adam mentioned. Now Sherpa Romeo, I'll just uh, go on here. So Sherpa Romeo is actually tells you what the policies are for each journal, whether they accept preprints or not. So if we go to, I don't know, uh, Nature, uh, Nature Paris, um, so here you go, you can have a preprint on a preprint server in Nature. Oh, you can't see it, wait a minute, hang on, slight technical, let's go back, okay, <coughs> there, so it's saying you can have that, whoops. Uh, with nature, uh, but there's also you also have to look out for the published version. They prefer you not. To, generally speaking, journals don't like it when you publish the version that they actually formatted, because they did it at a cost and they want copyright. But there are also other journals as well. There's mo most of the journals actually do accept preprints. The case where what Adam was talking about, the journal actually did have a policy that accepted preprints, and it was a peer reviewer that said, oh, I searched for this person, I found the article, it's already effectively in print, I am refused to review it. And there was a fallout of that. I don't know whether it's still ongoing, but there are, there are those cases that, that, that exist, I'm not going to lie to you. But generally speaking, you're kind of safe as ours is. Um, also these two as well, funders, Bill and Melinda Gates, Welcome Trust, they mandate preprints for bioarchive. You have to do it. Low visibility. Now, BioArchive is often used by geneticists, and they get 4 million uh, visits per month. And this actually showed what the first 30,000 preprints reveal about biologists. Um, so you can see here, neuroscience people, BioArchive is a place to be. And they actually found a correlation with the downloads to a paper and the impact factor that it was finally submitted to. Now, obviously, I can't say you why that is, but I think it's an indication that maybe um, they benefited from peer review by making it public, or it could be that 
one of the one of the great things about preprints is that people care more about whether they have accurately reported their data. So it's t absolutely it's not as ter it, submitting your journal and knowing that you're probably going to get your paper reviewed by two people is not as terrifying as tweeting it out so everybody in the world can see. And so it really forces you to make sure to actually prove it, and make sure all everything, every dot and comma is correct. So it could be that these pe these papers have had extra scrutiny before they've been submitted. And you see here that some 42% of all preprints and bioarchive eventually go into a peer-reviewed journal. Now you could say, well, that means what, like 58 maybe are not publishable standard, but I actually think that it's they just people just don't care. I know people that just do preprints. So I think it's not as clear as to say that the quality is not as good as those that actually make, if, if that makes sense. There is evidence to say that uh, published papers are better written, which makes sense because when you have a peer review, you do get comments on how to articulate things rather than, is the data accurate, are the inferences sound? So I'll just pause there. Does anybody have any questions? Oh yeah, so the yeah, so yeah. Thank you, Marion. Uh, the guy next door, I was talking to him the other day, and he said, "Oh, you know, I'm rushed. I've got my thesis deadline next month, and I've got a deadline today." And I said, oh, "You know, what's the deadline?" He says, "I'm submitting a paper. Oh, where, what journal?" He says, oh, "I'm submitting to Bioarchive." And the reason why he was so pressured to do it is because with Bioarchive, there's a sort of a period where they have to assess whether it's a legitimate submission, and he wanted to. to for when he actually can put it into his thesis and it'd be recognised as like a an actual preprint of pub or not a published but it's an actual paper that's there and therefore recognised as not a necessarily a thesis by publication standard but at least recognised as it's out there and it's undergoing sort of informal peer review. Any any other questions about that? I'll move on. So if if um, <laughs> to use an analogy from a drug addict. If, if weed doesn't do it for you and you want something stronger like heroin or crystal meth, registered reports is sort of the analogous argument. So you can do preprints, but registered reports is a full Monty um, approach to addressing publication bias, harking, and low statistical power. Now, I will disclaim that most of these sides have been ripped from Chris Chambers, who is pretty much registered reports are his brainchild. And just the other day, he published this uh, article, a brilliant article, and that eases you into what registry reports are uh, in nature, and it's, it's fantastic. So do read that. Now, the thing that registry reports are really good at is they address this results paradox. So I'll, I'll put it in Chris's words. So what part of the research study hypothesis method results of discussion should remain beyond a scientific control? The answer, of course, is the results, the part that matters most for publishing in prestigious journals and advancing careers. So in other words, you're putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank, right? You are trusting researchers to honestly report their results. And I'm not saying that everybody's out there for nefarious reasons to massage a, a, a p-value into the significant threshold range, but I am saying that it, the temptation is there and the temptation especially to look the other way. So registry reports really nail this in the in the chest. So a registry report is this. So basically you register your protocol in as much detail as possible and you submit it to whatever journal accepts registered reports. So you submit your protocol and then it undergoes a round of peer review I'm not sure how long it takes. I think it's a, a few months, maybe weeks. Um, but it's very journal dependent. And then it undergoes a review, and then there's a back and forth between you and the panel of reviewers. So they actually refine your protocol. Now, I should say that this is all before data collection, don't forget, right? So that you're registering your protocol before you even can see the results. And this is an actual example given to you on the OSF of the things that you should include in your registered report. So it has things like, what is your hypothesis? List them. What is the ex data exclusion? When are you going to stop uh, collecting data? Are you proposing any new data or any existing data? You know, what analysis are you doing? Are you doing Bayes? How, you know, all of these things 
that you really should be thinking about anyway tells you to think about them. So what then after that you give a, a, an IPA an in principle exceptions if they if it passes passes the muster and you're free then to collect your data and then you do everything that you said you were going to do you write up the paper submit it to the journal and then they say okay you did everything you said you were going to do great published they don't give a damn about the results null or positive so it really again now is a publication issue bias issue if of course there's no continuity between the two then they'll reject it but at cortex I think it's 100% acceptance at stage two and 90% here okay and according to Chris Chambers the biggest thing that gets you rejection is desk rejection so it's just inadequate listing of you know detail in your in your proposed in in that bit what I mentioned here so this the Again, Chris Chambers, so this assured acceptance means that authors are free to present results as they are without having to shoehorn them into a clean, compelling narrative. And the outcome is striking. So let's look at this paper here, which is a lovely, great paper too. So they wanted to see what re registered reports do to, to null findings. So they did a survey, I think mainly of psychology and life and health sciences. 66% of registered reports for replication studies did not support the initial hypothesis. Now think of what I said before about that 80% positive result rate I, I mentioned at the beginning. A novel study was 55%. So you can just see in red the traditional non-registered report research. And that's the estimate for conventional reports. So it is possible that researchers opt this for this format when they think that null findings are likely, that's true, but who cares? They're publishing null results, and null results are really important. Anne Scheel has, is doing also a similar work. So she compared registered reports with non-registered reports, and she finds similar things. So as you can see here, this is basically showing supporting the alternative hypothesis. 43% versus 96% for non-registered reports. So it's, it's all kind of showing the same picture. And if you want to ask Anne about anything that, about her work, you can see her on the 24th of October. And I put this soon to be doctor, because she is still a PhD student, and she's just absolutely killing open research in the minute. She's with Daniel Lakins. It's just, she's extraordinary. Anyway, so who does, you might want to, want to know who does registered reports, what journals are out there. Uh, so there's 207, but bear in mind that doesn't might not seem alike. But look at the sort of exponential uptake. So this, every time I see Chris, he, he says like, oh, last time I met him was in, I don't know, June. It was like 130 journals, and now it's September and it's 207. Uh, and Zotero actually has a repository of all the registered reports. So if you want to have a look at them and also the protocols. And I think this is particularly important for neuroscientists that want to do like a neuroimaging, which is the ball like of ball aches to, to nail down a protocol that, that, that you can be um, happy with. So another break time. Any questions about registered reports? Yeah? Oh, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, I think it's like Yes. 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 Uh, can I answer with a question? When you write a paper, what do you think about when you write a paper? You think about the introduction, what you're going to put in the introduction. Yeah. You think about what kind of analysis you're going to run, yeah. how you report the results, and what your discussion is going to be. That's exactly what you do in a registered report. The only difference is, is that you're doing it all at the beginning instead of doing it at the end. So there's no additional time. In fact, if anything, it's the opposite. You actually gain time. Because I've spoken to people that do register reports, and their most enjoyable thing is writing the paper, because it's all there. They don't have to think about anything. They just say, copy, paste, done. Jobs are given. And I hate writing. It's like, it's, it's up there with being buried alive. Um, <laughs> And so being able to just say, oh, I just, I just, you know, I've got three, three quarters of the paper done, I just need to write the discussion, 
off to the pub, right? Right, so any, you wanted to ask a question, Mary, yeah? Yeah, I've, seen, I've, I've heard a similar question. Sorry, I'm interrupted. Uh, I've, I've heard similar problems with like if PhD students do it. Because they're, um, I was thick as thick ladies when I started my PhD. So if I cobbled together some sort of protocol, I know I'll, I, I'd want to you know, put it under the carpet and nail the carpet down and never look at it again by the end of my PhD. The thing is, my, my response to that is, is, you know, you shouldn't be doing research in the first place if you can't really adequately put together a protocol and discuss it and, and really think about it. The other thing is, is that the thing what registry reports do brilliantly is that it makes the distinction between what you expected and the exploratory stuff. So if you were to find something interesting and fantastic that was published, you know, the day before you, you, know, you collected the data, you can say, okay, this is what we set out to do, but we found all this other cool stuff which we're going to do as well, but we kind of don't know what to expect and it wasn't predictive as part of the original protocol. You don't get that in a peer review paper as it's conventionally done. You just see the result of all of that with exploratory stuff. Okay, does that make, does that make sense? You can still do it. I'm not saying you can't do it. It's just that you said you you promised to do one thing. That's fine, though, but you can still do it. It's just that you're being transparent about the fact that, okay, we tried it one thing, there was a better thing, then we're going to try that. Okay. And in fact, in a way, it's actually good to say that it is actually crap, the new thing is it is better. But the fact that we were trying this out on this new day, it's new, hasn't really been fully validated yet, but you're making that distinction, which is really important. Okay, so the next thing is uh, the fourth horseman, which is low statistical power, and I think it's ugly twin uh, statistical ignorance. Now, I'm the first one to say I am statistically ignorant, so I'm part of the problem. Uh, so I'm trying to um, scrub my reputation clean by doing this talk because of, because of my ignorance. So if there is one paper that you should all read uh, before bedtime, it's this one paper here by Kate uh, and it, it basically shows you in neat detail why power is a problem and what it can do to really distort and disfigure research. Um, there's so much in the paper that it's, it's difficult to sort of capture, but there were certain things that really struck me about, about this paper, and this one in particular. So I'll just give you a quick example. If, um, just as a demonstration of how important statistical power is, let's say you were to run a study, and then you run another study and try to replicate the study of the first. Let's say if the result you got was just passing significance, so 0 0.05. Now you run it with the same sample, the chances are, I think, you have a 50% chance of getting the same result, statistically speaking. If you want to know more, read, read the paper. But that really struck me, so it really kind of puts in a different colour of light why people can't replicate other people's results when they say, oh, this other study, they, they had a sample size of 12 and I've got a sample size of 12. It's clear they're talking rubbish. No, it's just that the law of probability is that you just found noise. Um, but this, I've already been over this, what statistical power is. It's just the probability of finding a, um, the, the, the finding that you expected given the sample size that you've got. And the reason why statistical power is, is a problem and one of the four horsemen is because if you are underpowered and you find a significant result, what does that actually mean? Right. So I will go on to this, but it's just a, something to hold in mind. What does that mean when you find a significant result when your study is technically underpowered? Or likewise, when you find a null result and it's underpowered? 
How do you treat those two thoughts? Um, but first of all, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the audience, does anybody know what a p-value is, actually? Can anybody give me a definition of a p-value? Do you want to give me one? Okay, it's one. Anybody else? Okay, so the probability is it's effectively that, right? So the probability is of getting absor observed uh, data or extreme one given the null hypothesis is true. Okay. What a p-value is not is the probability that you'll observe some data, but it, uh, it's not the probability of the theory, okay, which is an often common misunderstanding. And I know this because there's been loads of research now to show that most statistical textbooks for undergrads say it's this and not this. Yes, Al, I thought it was if you re-ran the experiment a hundred times. You'd Which is, yeah, so just wait, okay. Adam. Uh, <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so basically what Adam's saying is that the frequentist philosophy to statistics is that it's likely in the long run that this effect will be borne out. So it's a kind of a it's an indication, it's a low resolution indication that there is something. And that's why John Ioannidis is against dropping the p-value because it does have some value. Um, Isn't it also a bit conditioned on the model? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. I won't get into this. Um, now, what I said before about what is it when you get a null result or a positive result and your, and your study is underpowered, right? So what happens is, is that you obtain a positive result and you, you just reject the null hypothesis. In fact, I was in a conversation yesterday with two senior academics and we were trying to scratch our heads over null findings. And they were trying as much as they could to explain why there was a null finding. And then one of them said, yeah, but you know, if it was positive, we'd just say, that, oh, there's an effect there. We wouldn't sort of explain away the positive result. Maybe it's chance. Maybe it's just noise. So there's an asymmetry, in other words, in how we treat null findings or how we infer null findings and positive findings. But what we should do is that when, so when we find a null hypothesis, you can't make a claim whether there's an effect or, or not an effect, which again is another misunderstanding. So some people, when there's no statistical result, they say there's evidence of absence. Um, when they really should say there's absence of evidence. And Stuart Ritchie talks about this in his talk as well. So what I'm trying to get across is if you have a bias selection of the literature which reports null results, and one thing I have actually missed that reports uh, positive results, um, so one thing you're misguided by that. The other thing is what Kate Button actually mentioned in this paper which I forgot to mention is the chances are that a result that's reported is an inflation of the true effect size. And it's, it's often called the winner's curse. So I will just go into this now here. So it's quite a messy way of getting the message across. But basically, by definition, if you find a significant result and you've got an underpowered study, the chances are the effect is going to be large. You all with me? Yeah? But the thing is, because it's not adequately powered, you're not converging on what is going to be the true effect, so the generally an overestimate. And what you find, and we, we see this in like theta-beta ratio for ADHD and neurofeedback, that as the years go on and more and more papers are published, the size of the effect gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So there was one lucky side that got a paper out of it, and then other people tried to replicate it, and then they found something, but it wasn't as big and so on. But because the precedent was set, they could report, you know, they could publish and, and so on and so forth. And this is an enormously wasteful enterprise to do. You have to go through 10 years, usually, for people to actually reject. And like EEG neurofeedback is sort of going through that growing pains at the moment. Now, there are suggested ways to solve this problem with p-values, and I won't go into them. And this was published recently, and Martin Gulliford, who was a pre previous speaker, was one of the signatories on this. And they said, well, we should report confidence intervals and effect sizes. Now, if you've been listening, I've just said that the majority of the literature is underpowered. The chances are that their significant result is an overestimate of their effect size. So if you're using effect size and confidence intervals, they're going to be useless. They're going to be overestimates. 
and there are different papers that suggest how we could do this. This is one here, which says that you sort of use a lower confidence interval as a conservative estimate of what the effect size should be, which then you can use to inform your power calculation, which I think is quite a nice way of doing it. But really, um, the, way to the way to actually think about your data and the way to analyze your data is one of two ways. Bayes is obviously uh, the most sort of proffered uh, solution to this, but you can also have equivalence testing as well. And Anne Sheel is going to talk about that in October. So Professor Martin Gulliford did a talk, and so did Zoltan Dianesh, who's a wonderfully articulate man. And he talks about Bayes, and he's got a lot of uh, talks, and uh, you can listen to his recording for the riots as well. Um, now... If you remember what I said about the p-value, and then it's the probability of getting observed or more extreme data, assuming the null hypothesis is true. So as I've said, you get a positive result, jobs are good and you're okay. You get a null result and you um and ah and you think about it and just thinking about those PIs I was talking about just a few moments ago, they scratch their heads and they try and figure out why we got a null result. Was it underpowered? Is it because we didn't do things properly, is it a crap study that we ran, and so on. So in other words, um, whoops. what we're dealing with is what I said in the previous slide, which is um, a p-value is a very impoverished, uninformative, low-resolution um, indicator of evidence for the null hypothesis. And the only way to solve this is with Bayes. I know I'm, I'm flicking around a bit. Um, and the, all of this stuff, actually, is uh, reported in a wonderful talk by Zoltan. Uh, that's the YouTube link there. So I'm lifting stuff from his talk. So anyway, right, let me, let's get my bearings. So basically, the, what I want to get across to you is that evidence supports a theory that most, strongly it predict, uh, that, that most strongly predicted it, which everybody thinks that's a very intuitive statement to make, right? So in other words, if a theory says something can't happen, but it happens, that falsifies the theory. If the theory says something can happen, but it doesn't happen, that falsifies the theory. Right? Everybody, that's like our bread and butter, right? Everybody gets this. But it's what p-values do not get, but Bayes does. So I'll just give you a kind of a gentle introduction to, what, to the thinking of Bayes on this. So you've got this dog, and we'll call him, or her puppy, actually. We'll call her puppy. A uh, very cute, adorable thing. That's your dog. That's not my dog. That's not what I wish it was. I should have it for the office. Now this is uh, this is not a puppy. This is uh, I don't know. What does he look Tasmanian like? Devil. It's a Tasmanian devil. Well, I don't know what name. Let's call him um, Archibald. Uh, now this this animal has got the the strongest bite force of for an animal of its size. And I was talking to Zoltan about this, and he said, if you're in the bush in Tasmania, if you're ever in the bush in Tasmania, by the way, and you see white droppings, it means there's a Tasmanian devil in the bush because they're scavengers and they eat bones. That's how strong their jaw is, right? So, they're puppy, I'm going to put her in a box. And I'm going to be devilish, and sometimes I might put the devil in the box, okay? So there they go, and I'll pack it away. So you don't know whether the devil is in the box or whether the dog is in the box. They're not together, so don't worry. And I want you to put your hand in the box, okay? Now, uh, I didn't get ethics for this, but um, I, went round, I went round KCL, and I knocked on a load of PIs' doors, and I said, uh, would, you, would you do this experiment for me? It's fine, it's safe. And so I asked people to put their hand in the box. And the dog, poor Poppy, one out of ten times she bit the person, took the finger clean off. The devil is nine times out of ten. Okay, So there's a lot of people with a missing digit. So Ling, who's uh, in our office, uh, there's certain things that she can't resist, and one of them is dogs. And so when I say to her, Ling, I've got this box and there might be a dog in it. So she says, oh, well, give me the box. <laughs> yeah. 
So I say to her, okay, Ling, put your hand in the box, and I just sort of see what happens. So which one do you think is the likely outcome, given the data I've given you? One out of ten chance that the dog will bite her, or nine out of chance that the devil will bite her? Which hypothesis is more <coughs> strongly supported, given our prior? Which one do you think is going to happen? What's the most likely outcome? Devil. The devil, right. Thanks. Okay. So... Um, so she loses a finger, and consistent with this, we can do a Bayesian analysis of this. And the way that we do it is this. We just take the probability of one hypothesis, that it's the devil, and the probability of another hypothesis, that it's the dog, and we just divide them for one another. Okay? And we actually get a Bayes factor of nine. So in other words, there's nine times the likelihood that it was the devil in the box as opposed to dog. Okay? It's very simple, intuitive. It barely needs a mention. So to give you another example, Ling really can't help herself, so she puts her hand in again, and she doesn't lose a finger. Okay. So which one is supported here? Is the dog in the box or is the devil? Which one do you think? Which one? The dog. The dog, the dog right? So you just do the same thing again. So in other words... The base factor is one divided by the other, so you've got nine times the likelihood that the dog is in the box over the devil. Okay, That's what a base factor does. Now I'm going to give you a third example, and that's it. So now, I, uh, I managed to get ethics this time, and uh, I run the study again. And I actually get a devil, um, and it was part of the... Uh, I was going to ask you, Adam, what was that study with the foxes, and they bred the nice foxes? Yeah, the Russian domesticated. Yeah. So this is, uh, this is a, they did this with devil, uh, uh, Tasmanian devils, and I get a mild-tempered devil, and it only bites people and takes the finger off six times out of ten. Poppy, she got rabies, so, <laughs> so now it's four times out of ten. She's just, she's riddled with it. And uh, so Link, really diff hard to learn, this girl. Uh, she puts her hand in again. And uh, she loses a finger. So now if we run the base factor again and divide the one probability against the other, we get a base factor of 1.5. So we don't really know. I mean, on one hand, it's, it could be 9 times out of 10 it's the dog. The other times it's 9 times out of 10 it's the devil. Here's 1.5. You wouldn't put money if there's a devil or a dog in there, right? Are we all kind of, are you all with me? That's exactly what Bayes factors do. That's exactly how you think about Bayes. You compare one model of the data against another model of the data, and you see which one is likely. Okay. So this allows us to make three distinctions. Evidence for the dog over the devil, evidence for the devil over the devil, or evidence of either way. We don't know. This three-way distinction, one cannot make with p-values. You either have a significant result or a null result. Okay. So they do not respect the idea that... Evidence supports a theory that, may, that most strongly predicted it. And why does this matter? So in another way, this is another way of sort of the notation of it. I won't go into the statistics of it. And I will come on to why this matters in a second. But just so you can interpret Bayes factors, I don't know why this square is here. But basically it's like this. So basically, the way that you can interpret the, this guy, actually, I'll, just, I'll have a digression. This guy was at Cambridge. And he first put down Bayes factors and stuff like this in a really famous book. I think he was a geologist in 1939. And uh, he was at Cambridge. Does anybody else know who was at Cambridge before the Second World War? Alan Turing. Alan Turing. And Alan Turing used Bayes to break the Enigma code. So if you do Bayes, <laughs> you could end up on the £50 note. Um, <laughs> and basically, he just... He gave benchmarks, Jeffrey did. And he said, so if you get a base factor of greater than 1, you have evidence for the alternative. If you get a base factor less than 1, you get evidence for the null. If you get somewhere in between, it's sort of anecdotal and sensitive, you don't know. Which is basically what I told you in those three examples before. Now, why does this matter? Why does this matter for statistical power? Now, in Jeff Cummings' work uh, here, he talks about the dance of the p-values. Has anybody seen this before? The dance, right. So basically, he did, he did a, low, a bunch of simulations, and he showed that when you run the test on different samples of the data, 
you will find you will always get different p values. It's a quite an elegant demonstration of just how much noise and chance plays into our findings. And he, he listed the p values here. This is actually taken from the, power, the YouTube video Zoltan did. And what Zoltan did, he calculated the base factors for each of these p-values. So if you get a p-value of 0.23 at the bottom there, uh, like I did yesterday, uh, when I found out my past year of my life, we found nothing. <laughs> I would, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's not a good day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you know, stuff like this, it's a real, it's a real, it breaks your heart. So Zoltan did this, and he calls it the Tai Chi of uh, base factors because he thinks they're more graceful. Now, as you, as I said in the previous slide, I'll just go back. Whoops. Uh, I said here that anything above one and anything below one is fine. But Jeffrey actually nuanced this a bit, and he said anything between a third and three is kind of insensitive. Okay, so a more stringent criteria is that anything above three is uh, great for the alternative. Anything below 0.3 is great for the norm. So let's have a look at our whoopsie data, our base factors again. So 0.23, we get a base factor of 1.73. So it's, we don't find anything, but it's actually going a little bit towards the alternative, right? It's going towards that three mark. So it just means it's insensitive. You don't lose your hair. We could just get more money, get a big sample, and we'll see what happens. Here, uh, we've got p-value of 0.817, and quite a, a lean towards the null, right? So you've got two p-values here that are both non-significant. One is leaning towards the alternative, the other is leaning towards the null. This is a distinction that p-values cannot give you. The only way that they can give you is, is through ruining your eyes in reading the literature and seeing whether something is plausible or implausible and to try and interpret it a million different ways. Bayes factors alleviate you of that slightly. So how do you do Bayes? Now, I'm, I am cognizant of time, so I've got seven minutes, so I will be brief. So you can do Bayes in JASP, and you can look at my, my tutorial on JASP, so I won't trouble you with it. So this study here, so this is, this is JASP, and I've just got this data from the data library, okay? And uh, it's basically looking at a reading intervention. And I'll just direct you to here. So it's an independent samples t-test. And this is significant with a, a decent effect size. I mean, if you if you were a psychologist, you'd be you'd be chuffed with that, right? Uh, so it looks it looks good. You know, you know, it's good it's good news, gravy. Now I ran a Bayes on this, right? A Bayesian analysis here. Now, do you remember what I said uh, about point four five? Yeah, that's Leaning towards, leaning towards the null, right? Now you can actually show that here. So whichever way you look at it, the data rests in sort of the insensitive anecdotal bit. Now the reason why what this graph actually shows you is something that Bayesians have difficulty with, which is the prior probability. So in the example I gave about the dog and the devil, I made up those numbers. But what you have to do, you have to do the humble work of going around reading the literature and thinking what is a probability of the null versus a probability of the alternative. Put that into your Bayesian calculation and then you can give an, a sort of a, a more precise estimate of what is more likely the null alternative or if it's insensitive. Um, but this actually gives you a robustness region, so it just tries all the different prior probabilities you could do. Okay. And it shows here, no matter which way you look, the evidence, sorry, yeah, the evidence is for H1 and probably more. Sorry, I got that wrong there, I don't go into that. But anyway, it, it, any prior probability that you put, it's always in the anecdotal, so you need to have more data. So, um, if you want to know how to do Bayes, 
Dan Quintana actually did a great paper here, and you can actually go go to the paper, run the analysis that he did with the data he had, and he will give you step by step sort of instructions of how to do it. Um, now I'm yeah, so I've got four minutes. Um, Shall I just use those for questions? Okay. Anybody got any questions about what I've just discussed? No, or are you? So yeah, you'll notice here that there is a sort of relationship, and and Zoltan said that he's looked at hundreds of Bayes and p-values, right? And he said there is a relationship only if the effect that you predicted is the effect that you got, and usually when it's borderline. So uh, say a three for the, what was it? I can't remember these things. So um, you could get, say, um, a p-value of 0 0.05 is about the three. Yeah. Then but, but he said, but you can, de you can demonstrate how these two things can come apart. So it's only in certain conditions where there is a, it's not perfect, but there is a, a, a step um, in step relationship between p values and bays, but as he said, if p values get the same information as bays, there wouldn't be a reason to have bays. So there's so the, sometimes they overlap, but most of the time they don't. Right, point zero zero two was a forty six. Yeah, yeah. So there is a relationship. Sorry, yeah, there is a relationship, but this is simulated data, so it's sort of perfect. So they already have. They know what their effect sizes that they're looking for, whereas we don't. We're sort of scrambling in the dark. Um, so I'll just wrap up on the last few things. This is a starter pack. Anybody who wants to get interested in open science, these are the things to start with. Uh, open science move, Daniel Lakins and um, R&R Markdown by Lisa de Bruin. Fantastic resources. <coughs> uh, if you're on Twitter, follow these people too. Or the riots. Or the riots. That goes without saying. Other hints and tips. Has anybody heard of Sci-Hub? Does anybody know what Sci-Hub yeah, is? Yeah, they put my book on there. Did they? Great. <laughs> <laughs> really, they okay. me out of another life. Yeah. Uh, well, Sci-Hub, um, so the Russians are really good at, um, <laughs> at winding people up. And they wind um, Elsevier up a treat. Because uh, what they do is basically they say you take you f whatever paper you want to, and you can't get access to, you copy and paste the URL, put it in there, and it will get the paper. So you don't need to pay. It's all open access. Every paper is open access. So you go on there and then, yeah. Uh, other things. So if you want to know more about open science, read this uh, uh, preprint here, and it, it shows you um, a list of papers that are really important. Um, if you want to know more about Bayes, Alexander Etz is great and he gives you annotated reading list and of course the Riots Club. Uh, so yeah. And then of course there's Twitter and just to show you how important Twitter is, all of this, this presentation I started on Monday and it was all um, powered by Twitter. Okay, So I got this meme from this guy, I, Chris Chambers, I only found out about it this way. Uh, I found out that paper that showed you the value of preprints from these. There's Anne Shield, who I found out on Twitter too. And of course, Dan there with that JASP and Jim uh, and Bayes demonstration. So it's a piece of piss when you have Twitter. So that's it for now. Uh, any questions? No? Say again? Uh huh. Do what you say. Yeah, so that's why. So in Zoltan's talk that he did for the riots, he he <coughs> kind of he dismisses that, and quite rightly so because it 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 kind of is a non-problem when you do this bloody thing. Uh, when you um, when you have this robustness region, so what this is basically doing is just doing a sensitivity analysis of all a range of different priors. 
So if you sort of have a kind of plausible range of priors, you just keep running the same analysis, and you say, no matter what prior I use, I'm still getting the same result. So you, so it, you can, you know, it alleviates you of that concern that oh, I don't know whether the prior I'm using is correct or not. So you can. So here, the default prior in Just is 0.7, which is is sort of like uh, Cohen's D 0.7. So you can see it here, but it tries them all here. So a prior of zero to a prior of one. So you can just do that. Now, of course, I don't know what the, the literature is here, but you know, it could be that an effect size of 1.5 is a bit too much, right? I mean, given in psychology, you're, you're, you're talking of effect size of 0.3 in your sort of here. So it can show you all that, and then you can just report that in the paper. And I should also say that Zoltan sort of he, he, he says a, a, a B for every P, so he reports all the... So one thing is really annoying is that whenever you talk about values, people say, oh, well, journals don't understand them, it's really difficult to explain them or whatever. I'm not saying that you should not report statistical significance tests. It's just you can report both. I mean, you do that anyway with effect sizes. Just bloody report the two. Um, and forget about what the, the journal says, because as long as they can see their blessed P value, then they're happy. Yeah, I mean, the, this is, I mean, the, the whole reason of the talk is to show you labor saving ways. I mean, it hasn't really come across really, but if you could just, if you say, uh, one example of way, how you could use Bayes in this instance is that you, so some people, they don't know whether they've got enough subjects. So if you've got no result, okay, it could be that you're underpowered. So you run the Bayes and then you find it and then you just run more people. Uh, if you find that it supports the null, then you don't run more people. You've, you've saved time collecting more data if you just relied on the p-value and thought, oh, I just need to get more subjects. I'm tired of hearing, oh, we've got a null result with TDCS, which is brain simulation, because we're underpowered. But the thing is, is that you don't know that with a p-value. It could be underpowered, or it could be that you've got damn good evidence that there's no bloody effect there. And you can show this. And there's also issues with optional stopping and stuff, which Bayes does not have a problem with. Yeah, Alexander. Um, this could just be me having my brain hurt, so I'm going to answer that. Obviously, there's the robustness region. How much, given you have to go through the literature to find the value of the probabilities, how much scope would you say is there for the bias quality of the data? You, you, yeah, yeah. So the, the this is <coughs> beyond my. I'm I'm very much at the limits of my knowledge on Bayes on this, but the recommendation is that you can make your estimate really conservative. So you have to clearly demonstrate an effect in order for you to pass that sort of significance mark. Okay, in which case, so you protect yourself against any embarrassing findings that you say are there, which are not there. So you can do that, and you, the easiest way to do that is to just divide the effect size by two. Yeah, it's possible. Um, it, you know, if you do a powered study, maybe it's exploratory. Exploratory work isn't really, it's not amenable to registered reports, I should say. That's the first thing. But you could do something like you, you, run, a, you run 50 subjects 
and then you realise that recruitment was really good, so you thought, why not do more? And maybe you 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 ran a test of fifty, and you didn't find anything. Or maybe it's uh, and you can do that, and you can do without in the absence of failures if you wanted to. It's just that you you are telling the the reader that I ran a s s test at fifty, and I collected another seeking to try and find a, a significant result with an extra few subjects. Is that, is that clear? The other thing of why you would use Bayes is that you could use it as a sort of a way to judge whether your stopping rule is um, effective or not. So like, as I've said before, if you get 50 people and then you find a null effect and then you run the Bayes, and you could say, well, um, given the literature on this and given the high probability, probably I do need more subjects. And then you say, okay, so the optional stopping rule, uh, the, the stopping rule was not adequate, so I collected more. And again, you're being honest about this. But in the um, bit on this, um, let me just try and find where it is. can actually say that there's no stopping rule, or you could say there might be an option to continue collecting data. So how many options will be collected and what rule will you use to terminate the data collection? Um, so you, you know, data exclusions, and it also says, you know, if you're using Bayesian methods, what is your prior? And you can say that, but you can, it's just, the whole point of registry reports is just making it absolutely transparent all the decisions that you've made. So you don't really, and so long as those decisions are justified, you've got nothing really to worry about. It seems there's some kind of ghost factor operating though, because long before all these excellent efforts, um, some areas have been having much more responsibility than others. Mm. Like, personality. Case, personality said the results are much more applicable than mm. most subjects. Mm. So why do you think, what is that? What were they doing right all those years ago that caused that? A field specific thing, or I, think it's I think it's where the money is. I mean, is personality lucrative? Not really. So you just get, um, I don't know how to put this. Uh, neuroscientists, and you know, there's a lot of money in neuroscience and genetics, so there's a lot of competition there, and there's a lot of race to the finish. So you're going to get people that cook corners and compromise their rigor and the competition for careers and job opportunities is much fiercer in those fields. So that's where you will find there's a difference in distribution in where the quality of research suffers. Whereas with personality, but I'm not saying that personality have not gone through that. They may have done when it was particularly fashionable, but I don't know. The social psychology has been the other way. That's been terrible. Mm -hmm. In Very fact, right. in fact, um, uh, Finelli, uh, I can't. I the pay, he shows the hierarchy of uh, the sciences, so it actually shows you like physics. They're quite replicable, and as you go down, psychology is like the is worst. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. So that that picks up on another point, which is, I think, going to be the next crisis in the replication crisis is the measurement crisis. That we're not measuring what we say we're going to measure. Um, so it really undermines our power calculations because our effect sizes are based on the measures that we've used. And I can't give you a you know a stonking good example of this, but I think we can all know that. I mean, Marion. In Marion, her expertise is in is in inhibition, and uh, every which way you could define it, inhibition, it's been done, and uh, we don't know whether we are actually measuring inhibition or not. Because we cannot mm -hmm. measure it. 
because yeah, there's there's nothing that you can hold it up against to say that's a sanity check. But also, we're it's really hard yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It's, um, to my point of view, feels discriminatory. Like even in some conditions, I have things that are only applicable to SVP in terms of immigration and just whatever happens in the country. Yeah. So I have to put it short on the frame. So okay. I just would like to, um, for just seconds of this time, first of all, to thank Joel for coming, but to thank Sam um, for creating the riots and for giving um, what four of us could. Um, Sam is an amazing scientist, an amazing colleague, but also an amazing friend, and today, as I said, is his 30th birthday. Mm -hmm. So if you can all um, join us. Oh, sh I wondered why she'd gone out there. <laughs> Bloody <laughs> blue. <laughs> I, you know, I, I was going to put a candle, but thank uh, God I didn't yeah. because I was out there for 10 minutes. Oh, but happy birthday. Good. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh, thanks, guys. Thanks, <laughs> cheesecake. <laughs> thank you very much. Wow. Well, do, we, do you want to all have a piece? <laughs> have, we, have we got I'm any cookery? Sure. And enough for everybody. We have one cake. But, uh, <laughs> well, we can, have, we got any, have we got any cookery or anything? Should we ask the... Well, Oh my god. I was there. <laughs> was I was I talking too much? I was answering too many questions.